Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Wordsmith Playtime number four. Uh, this is a ongoing project we've been doing once every two weeks, uh, in which we have a member of the Houston theater scene talking about a play they are familiar with and discussing why it works. Uh, today we are joined by Crystal Ray, who's going to discuss the play Effing A by Susan Laurie Parks, except in Susan Laurie Parks' version, they actually say the word. I don't mind saying it live on stream, but there are some who might. But I'm going to turn it over to Crystal now and let her talk. Thank you, Ian. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, uh, wow. You right now are living a small little bit of my dream. When I moved to Houston from Abilene some years ago now, um, one of the top five theaters I said, I hope I get to work with this group was Wordsmith. No joke. Like, that is a true statement. Um, and I'll tell you why. I looked at their website and I was like, oh, they do readings? Don't they help new playwrights? Oh, okay, okay. I need that. I need to be a part of that. And then I saw there was a picture of somebody that looked like me. I was like, oh, they're not scared of black people. Let's go. So that wordsmith was like on my list of, of theaters and groups and artists that I was hoping, fingers crossed, I could connect with. And um, I'm so glad that that has happened. And I'm glad to be here with you today. So that being said, Anytime I put my foot in my mouth during this talk, that is my fault and my bad. You can email me at crystalrayton at yahoo.com. I'm going to buy the wordsmith about it. This, this craziness that's happening over here is all in my head. <laughs> and so that was my disclaimer. Okay, we're getting into it right here with my girl, Susan Laurie Parks. This is her play. Um, it's called The Red Letter Plays. It's a compilation of two plays. Um, but the one we're talking about is effing A, and we're gonna say effing, they spelled the whole word out, you know what the word is, eh, no need to go there, right? Um, it was produced here in Houston by Diverse Works, and I don't wanna miss any names, the information is right here. It's, it was under Loris Bradley, um, who was the managing arts director for Infernal Bridegroom Productions, and this was back in 2000, right here in the Mozart State, Houston, Texas. Um, don't let anybody tell you Houston ain't doing big things, baby. Houston does big things. Um, the question, though, is why do plays work? And when I was pondering that and thinking through that phrase, I realized I could not answer that question until I knew what the word work meant. For instance, if I'm sitting on a park bench and it holds me up while I'm sitting there, I'm going to say the bench works. But if I'm sitting in a car, I could be having the same exact sitting experience, but if the car doesn't move and if the car doesn't go down the street and it's incapable of doing that, I would say the car doesn't work. Um, and that's because of what I expect the car to be able to do. I don't expect that from the bench and therefore the outcomes are different and what I say of it is different. So with that in mind, I defined work I am such a teacher and I apologize for that. No, I don't. I defined work in order to then explain why I think effing A more than works. So when I say play works, here's what I mean. Was I entertained? Um, did I get educated in some way or enlightened? And that's a broad spectrum kind of thing. Um, and did I enlist? So entertainment is probably the easiest one to understand right off the bat. I don't have to explain it. Was I enthralled? Did I did it hold my attention? Right? Entertained. Eh. But the educated, enlightened part is kind of iffy, so I'll dive into that a tiny bit. When I go to a play, I hope to hear something new. Um, it doesn't have to be a whole play of new. That can be tiring. But just maybe a little something new. And when I read Fing A, Mm. There were so many little jewels of new thoughts and ideas that are just sprinkled all throughout that script that took my heart by surprise that it totally knocked that one out of the park. And then the last one was, did I enlist? And here's what I mean by enlisting. Um, if you've seen Lion King, the musical, you or even 
the stinking advertisements, the commercials for it. You know, it's a beautiful musical. I mean, puppets, gigantic elephants, and you know, I mean, all of that, right? I saw that in Chicago and I left that show, no lie. I left that show and went to Menards, which is our local Lowe's in Chicago, um, kind of like a Home Depot. I went to Menards. I bought mirrors. I bought a, ba uh, but a banister so it could be a ballet bar, baby. I bought a drill, screws. I went into the basement that, <laughs> that had been re refinished. I didn't ask my parents. I drilled holes into the wall. I put that banister up. I glued mirrors to the wall. I had made a whole dance studio because I saw that musical and left it so moved that I wanted to participate in what I saw. I wanted to learn to dance that way. I wanted to learn to sing that way. I wanted to learn to act that way. And I built a whole studio in the basement. My grandmother was like, she didn't put no holes in my wall, not my wall. Like, she was done with me. That's how moved I was. And I enlisted immediately. Okay, so I, I, I hope that's clear. So what is effing A about? In case you're not familiar, I'll give you the short end of it. It's signature theater summary, and I've got little note cards to help me out because that's who I am. Signature theater says, the red letter plays effing A and In the Blood are two modern day remixes of Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic novel, The Scarlet Letter. Effing A follows the story of Hester Smith, a revered, and reviled local abortionists. Ah, so the A in this particular play stands for abortionist. Now, is this play relevant for today? <laughs> Buckle your seatbelts, oh my goodness, yes. Um, how much more so considering all of the current turmoil um, culturally and the clashing culturally. P.S. I do not speak for every African American, nor do I speak as Speaker of the House for my gender, or even just short people. Whatever box I can be put in, I have not been deemed their representative. I'm just Crystal. So, hot button issues all out through the wazoo in effing A. You got a pro-life, pro-choice fight, you have a penal system um, conversation, and you have the power of bitterness. So, all the peace to help keep them organized. So, We've got an abortionist who feels stuck in her job, who feels as if the only way to rescue her son who has been placed in the penal system is to continue doing this job that she doesn't want to do, um, to rescue her own baby. She's taking babies to rescue a baby. Mm, I'm telling you, when I say Susan Lori Parks, y'all, Susan Lori Parks, Okay, so already I'm getting a narrative and a monologue and a thoughtfulness um, that isn't a part of my everyday conversation. So it's checking off my enlightenment box because I get to hear a point of view um, that I don't usually get a chance to converse with on a daily basis. And that is the beauty of theater, right? The capacity to expand our empathy and our thoughts um, in a way that is both concise and succinct and to the point. It's like a laser beam. Good writing is like a laser beam, cuts right to it very quickly. So I'm getting this narrative from, from Hester, um, from a person who is in a profession that is touchy, right? Oh, touchy. Okay. Okay, so penal system. Her son was put in jail for stealing food as a little boy, and the penal system lost her son. They have no idea where he is. The son escaped. The penal system knows that there are a couple of people that escaped. They don't know for sure if it's her son or not. It is her son, we find out later. Not only is it her son, but um, she has trouble identifying him. Hester had a plan. Just before they took her little boy away from her, six, maybe seven years old, she bit him on his arm. The point of the bite was so that she would recognize him if she ever got him back. 
This man that shows up in her house looks like the sketches of the guy that escaped. Ugh. So she's looking at this mark on his arm and she goes, oh, but you can't be my boy. And he says something so pointed. He says, there were only two options. I either stay a boy or I become a monster. And it wasn't working for me to stay a boy. So now we have a conversation about what does it mean, what age, at what age does a black boy become a monster? If he doesn't become a monster, that means he stays being treated like a little boy his entire adult life. What man do you know wants that? He feels stuck with only two options. Hester feels stuck in her profession. And then the power of bitterness comes raging through the story because this escaped convent young boy turned monster falls in love with the rich woman who sent him to jail in the first place. He doesn't recognize her. She doesn't recognize him. They do what grown people do. And little Miss Rich Girl, who we thought was barren, comes up pregnant. And guess who ain't having that? Hester the abortionist who lost her son to the prison system at the hands of the rich girl. So with a little bit of cunning, our dear protagonist tricks the rich girl to come by her house for a little bit. And she undoes the pregnancy. She doesn't know that's her grandchild she just killed. She just knows she's getting the girl back. Ah, knife in stomach twist. It's a Greek tragedy. Everybody dies. Oh my goodness. Well, not everybody. Mostly everybody. Hester's still alive, but everybody she loved is gone. So that's kind of the summary according to Crystal Ray. So entertained. Oh my goodness. Didn't put the book down. Educated. I'm hearing new voices I never heard from. I've not heard a lot of stories from a Black abortionist who feels stuck. I haven't heard a lot of stories from an escaped convict who comes looking for his mommy and there's a love story that I've never imagined before in my life and this is why Susan Laurie Parks is a Pulitzer Prize winner. She is smart as day. The love story is between an abortionist and the local town butcher. He loves her and he thinks she's beautiful and they talk about what it means to serve meat and how to kill an animal so it doesn't hurt. And she understands everything he's saying, and even though she doesn't want to understand it. And they have this weird bond because their professions aren't the same, but they're oddly similar. Ay, yay, 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 yay. And he wants to marry her so badly, but she pushes love aside because she hasn't had her vengeance yet. Enlisted. We're at my little last E. By the end of the story, I was definitely enlisted. It made me double check. After I was done reading this, I had to ask myself, Crystal, are you walking around branding people? Do you do that to others? Do they have a point of view that's different than yours, a profession that you don't quite understand? Do they take a stance that doesn't quite agree with you and you throw them in a box and brand them with a the letter so you don't have to deal with them anymore? Hey, self-reflection, baby. After I was done with this, I couldn't help but ask myself, do I sometimes put good things on hold because I am too angry or bitter about something else? Am I allowing myself the beauty of love and all of the things that are available? Or do I count myself unworthy? Susan Lord Potts is unafraid. She is the most fearless playwright I have ever read. I mean, hot button issue after hot button issue, and she is unafraid to dance in the lilies of all of it. It is beautiful and it is horrifying. So what were her reviews like? Well, depends on who you ask, right? I've got one from the New York Times that says she's the critic's pick. The writing is timeless and enduringly relevant. And then, you get all the way over here to David Finkel. In 2003, he said the writing is predictable and unengaging. So what does that mean? I think if a play works, it's kind of like a tuning fork. 
you ring it and you listen for the other instruments to tune to that thing. And if you tune to it, it was your note. And for me, I tuned right to it. I was enlightened, I was entertained, I was educated, and it forced me to check myself. I enlisted in the process. It's not a read for everybody, but if you're looking to be challenged, pick it up. So that was my review of it. Now, how do I wrap this up? Quite easily, actually. If you're a writer, this last little bit is for you. Um, do you write things in order to be relevant or in order to be resonant? I think writing in order to be relevant, you sit down and you're going to write something about the Black Lives Matter or you're going to write something about whatever the hot button issue is for you. Only to, only for that topic alone, you run, I feel, you run the risk of maybe being formulaic and mechanical. I would challenge you to write what resonates with you, what vibrates in your soul, what makes you sing. Can I give you an example? This is going to be a silly example, maybe for some of you, but it is true to life, I promise. I was a little kid, maybe six or seven years old, and one of my favorite shows to watch, Lucy Ball, I Love Lucy, on Nick at Night, it came on, <laughs> on Nick at Night, this is the 90s, right? So it's coming on Nick at Night, right after Patty Duke, who I did not get with, I didn't understand it, and really just before that whole Mayberry Jazz with white people and fishing poles and all that. Lucy was who I was there for. And there was an episode when Lucy was trying to tell Ricky that she was pregnant. And it's a Lucy Ball episode, so of course it doesn't go right for the first 26 minutes. And then the last two minutes, Lucy slips a note to Ricky while he's performing at his club. And it says, my husband and I are pregnant. I haven't told him yet. Would you please sing? We're having a baby. And that will be my way of letting him know. And here, Ricky, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> so he starts singing. We're having a baby, my baby and me. And he goes from table to table to table to table, find, trying to find the couple. He gets to Lucy and she nods yes. And Ricky laughs, and then his revelation <clears throat> drops on him. And um, that close-up on Ricky, that's how, when I think of being in love, I relate it to that look. His look, when he realized that Lucy was pregnant and he was a dad, that look is seared in my mind's eye as to what it looks like when you have great news and the person you love is, is I, and I know that's so silly, but it resonates. It resonates with me right now. I'm saying it right now and you probably can't tell because my internet is slow. I am like near willing to tear up about this thing. I have loved that scene since I was six years old. That's how I, def that's how I picture what love looks like. Now, when the writers of the Lucille Ball show, and this might have been like the 300th episode or whatever, did they know that a Black girl in the 90s who's going to be watching that on her television <laughs> would resonate with that? Yeah, I'm guessing a big N-O on that one. But the deal is, is that the writing was good and it resonated with them at the time. And when you write what resonates, the propensity of it to continue to resonate with others is is unstoppable. When you write simply to be relevant or simply to be timely or to be with the craze or whatever is trending, it, it potentially could be sterile. So for those of you who are creating new things right now, if it's relevant and resonant, wonderful, but please, it's got to resonate with you first and then let it resonate with two others and see how it goes. Rewrites, right? <laughs> and then give it to organizations like Wordsmith and let them hear it and give you feedback and watch the resonance and then put it up and see what 200 people say and see if it resonates. There will always be somebody who doesn't get it and will say that the writing is blah, 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 formulaic. That person will always exist. But for those of us who will be 200 years, 90 years, 60 years away, ethnic, ethnicities away, culturally away, if you've written from an honest place, it can and will still resonate. 
So I leave you with the challenge, read stuff outside of your normal hemisphere and write stuff that resonates. Thanks for your time. And on that, uh, yeah, so uh, William Duell uh, thinks uh, your line, good writing is like a laser beam is great and very interesting. Uh, Melissa Flower uh, says the relevance versus resonance question is such a good question and absolutely Susan Lloyd Parks is resonant through time. Uh, oh my gosh, yes. Yes, indeed. So I'm going to ask, uh, do you think this, uh, this resonance has anything to do with it being a retelling? Uh, since you... Mm. Um, yes and no. I mean, because we see spinoffs all the time that work and don't work, right? So, like, sure. um, uh, the the fact that Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, play inspired um, this this continual <laughs> this continual thinking about how we brand people um, uh, as a springboard, maybe so. But she doesn't really reference if it was adultery in effing A, as it were. Um, as the leading idea, then I'd call it a spinoff. But I think more or less, it's a, it's a to me, in my opinion, it's it's a, like a launching pad of ideas. But it feels like a whole other planet in a way. But if you like, if you haven't read Nathaniel Hawthorne, you're not lost. You know, they they don't really intertwine in that fashion. But yeah, it is cool to be. I like watching work that's inspired by other work. I like tracing back to see if there are any connective tissues and how it relates. But yeah. It makes it most easier to sell also, which is maybe not a cool thing to say, but it is show business, right? So when you're right, trying right. to sell an idea to say uh, <laughs> that um, an offshoot of Nathaniel Hawthorne, well, that he has an audience space. So you know what I mean? Like it may teach that in school. So it certainly makes it easier to, to pitch to others. It gives a framework. All right. Uh, from William Duell, uh, you know, we're talking about resonating. Can you talk about why this play resonates now? Oh, um, the, the, the penal system resonates with me really loudly because I'm, uh, uh, as a teacher in the, in the public education system, there is a constant conversation in my mind about how um, our schools are not designed to see the success of African-American boys to, to, to their full fruition. Um, and there, there are people smarter than me that have written on this, and, but when... Hester's whole deal is the fact that her son at six or seven years old um, was pretty much tried as an adult and then lost within the system. My brain was like, <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's not a far gone idea. It's not like saying a unicorn walked by. It's like, no, really, let's go down the street to this public school and look at their graduation rates. It's a, it's a right now deal. Um, so that, since that's her whole beef through the whole play, um, they, it definitely resonated with me and, and who I want to be as an educator and what I want for uh, my nephew and um, the people in my family that I love. I hope that answers the question. Oh, it does. <laughs> I don't know, do I end this thing? Because <laughs> I'm um, happy to shut it down. <laughs> well, I, mean, I was thinking we could stick around and see if we get any more questions. Oh, see if I come up with anything else. <laughs> don't, don't go yeah. first. S since I'm here, I may as well abuse my power and... <laughs> to whom much is given. <laughs> hmm. Uh, okay, here's here's one. Uh, you said uh, it's a it's in a collection with in the blood, which I guess is another play about uh, about you know also inspired by Scarlet Letter. Exactly. Yes. Uh, that, yes, you're exactly right. Um, so in the blood, a completely different story altogether. Um, but in the blood um, is about uh, Hester La Nagrita. Um, um, who is a penniless mother, I got it written down, a penniless mother of five. <laughs> and so that, that completely different story, but we're watching a mom in that story who um, 
is raising her kids underneath a bridge and all of the people that orbit her have misused her in some way and but not, none of the people who are orbiting her are considered culturally uh, they're they're the upper echelon so their behavior is excused but because of where she is within the system of society her behavior is unexcused so it's it, it's still the letter a and all of that um but we're watching an entirely different group of people kind of uh she's marginalized and in every way but oh, she just keeps it, it's this like refusal to die thing for in the blood that just makes you just oh my gosh she refuses to give up if this doesn't work then i'm going to do this it's this con constant scrappiness um, uh, that that the hester in that story has that is um it's convicting yeah it's really beautiful uh here's a question from rachel dixon how do you feel a title affects the journey of a play? So, um, <laughs> especially if you've titled it Effing A and people won't even say your title. Um, I read a, um, a response that uh, Susan Laurie Parks did concerning the title and she said, it might be more title than what the actual plays are. And I think what she meant by that is it might give people an idea uh, that, you know, what, what is this? Is this going to be some kind of, you know, adult film, you know, <laughs> like what's happening? Um, and it's, it's, it, it is adult, but it is not crass. It's not, uh, it's not an adult HBO 1 AEM play. It, it, it's, it, I do think though, uh, you're asking, the audience to do um some some like army crawling to get to the show when the title is so aggressive uh, and it's an aggressive title the, but the concepts are aggressive so i don't necessarily think it should be it should it be hard but she didn't but it is hard immediately like the the immediate conversation of how do we spell effing on behalf of uh a genteel audience, you know, <laughs> Woo! you know, these pearl clutches. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you maneuver? And, um, and if you're the writer, do you care that the theaters are going to have to maneuver? Most of them will, will choose to maneuver. And does that bother you? Or do you write something in your statement that says you may not maneuver? You will say this word or don't write. I mean, and so that, um, she she of she she's allowed theaters to maneuver and respell and ha, you know hashtags and pound signs and exclamation whatever you do you know um dashes and hyphens but uh yeah a, a title matters a title matters as much as what you name your kid right so like it is it, it a title matters i think once you've read the play uh the title doesn't matter but you gotta you gotta get past it first. I don't know. It's a hard door to open. You you know, take a battering ram and get through. You know. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Wordsmith did a collaboration with Queensberry on a play that also had profanity in the title, and that one was kind enough to provide an alternate title for us. So it was Dog Fuckers or the one with the dogs. <laughs> Wow, that's a, this is, this is very different. Those are very ill. Then, okay, so then with suddenly has connotation that is so large. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's like, do I know you or have I known you? And that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of connotation um, to, to read into it. Um, yes, but, and that's something I didn't think about is providing the, and I don't know if Susan Laurie Parks did that or not, if she's, if she's got, <laughs> you know, variations of her own title already worked out that would be a great thing to research wow <laughs> the one with the dog that's funny yeah. cool yeah uh 
William says, great explanation of the title, even the New York Times won't print it, which I personally find disrespectful. Uh, here's a question from Debrina Sandifer. What do you think about the way the playwright applies inspiration from the Scarlet Letter, but also Abe Lincoln, the jazz concept of uh, rep and rev, and other bits that some may not associate with African Americans or African American characters? Could you reread that? Sure. What do you think about the way the playwright applies inspiration from the Scarlet Letter, but also Abe Lincoln, the jazz concept of, I'm assuming this is repetition and revolution, maybe? And other bits that some may not associate with African Americans or African American characters. I think I copy. Um, thank you for rereading it too. Um, I might be misspeaking, and if so, please throw in another comment um, because my uh, intelligence is finite. Um, uh, but but here's the deal: I think the, the the Abe Lincoln and stuff is a reference to Top Dog Underdog. I might be mistaken. I don't recall uh, Abe reference. Repetition and revision. Okay, that's what that is. Repetition and revision. Okay, um, so it's been a while since I read Top Dog and uh, Top Dog Underdog. Loved it. Here, uh, here's the fun thing with the whole Abe Lincoln and historical references and what is black and what isn't black, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and if this is a bunny trail, I'm sorry. And yes, she is referencing Top Dog Underdog. Ooh, okay. Um, so, uh, la, 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 la. so the whole Nathaniel Hawthorne thing and 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 in the blood and then Top Dog Underdog and Abe Lincoln. So uh, I think I got my questions. Uh, I think I've got them separated. So um, the in, the fact that we are inspired by other writers and other concepts and other ideas is cool. Um, according to Susan Laurie Park, she never even read, she hadn't read um, the Scarlet Letter when she decided she would write it. She was only familiar with with the concept of being termed or branded an adulterer. Um, so that's also very interesting. Um, it's interesting how prevalent um, concepts can be even if we don't know the, the, the direct origin of those concepts right so just like if you know so so that's cool in and of itself um what is and isn't black i uh, i lose my black card all the time if you if um the way i talk and in general just me being me um has never fallen under the world of what is blackdom as is defined by whoever has the gall to define it. Um, I'm, I never make the list. Here's what I think about the list. The list is contrived and it is limited to about five or six things and none of them uh, encompass the truth. And the truth is, is that uh, the culture that is relegated to the term black is too magnanimous to be listed on a list. It just is too big. Um, I think it comforts us to be smaller. It comforts us to be like, oh, you're black if you sound like this. Uh, you're black if you do this. And so that you could check some boxes off because it just, whoo, I checked that box off. Good thing I'm still black. Listen, get rid of the list. I think it's impossible to write black. There are things I could probably gauge a black audience might know. Um, but at the end of the day, if I'm saying it, it's black, because <laughs> I'm black. So like, <laughs> uh, when I hear Top Dog Underdog and the Abe Lincoln references and whether or not black people will get it, if black people read, then they'll get it. If, they, if they're interested in researching it, then they'll get it. If they're interested in diving in, then they'll get it. I mean, if we're interested in expanding our minds, then we'll get it. If we're not interested, then it'll walk right past us. And that is also okay. Um, but I, I, I worry about writing, hoping black people will get it and only writing things I think black people will get. Liz, I'm okay with writing stuff and black people going, no, what was it? That was crazy. But did you leave with something? Were you educated or enlightened? If you were, then I did my job as a writer. Um, and I think Susan Laurie Parks is unafraid to go into crazy places. Um, and by crazy, I mean places black people don't usually go into. Um, it might be why I am just such a fan. I don't fan out a lot, but if there was a comic con for playwrights, 
I would be going as Susan Lowy Parks. I just hands down, I wouldn't even think of it. That's how much I admire her. Um, and her willingness to put on gloves and get in there and be Muhammad Ali and just and just lay it on your face. Like what? No, wait, get up. Oh. You know, flow like a fly like a butterfly. Whatever, float. I don't know. Um, I don't do boxing. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Thanks. Anyway. That Cassie's Clay moment was brought to you by the fact that I was trying to make a metaphor. Um, but that the, the the deal being she goes to new places and if you go with her, it'll be a beautiful journey. And it's not worth being a play if you don't ever want to go to someplace new. If you don't ever want to hear somebody's opinion that's new, if you never want to experience an idea, a concept, a new culture, then you shouldn't have gone to see a play, nor should you write one. If you're only going to write the stuff we've already seen and we've already heard, then throw up in my mouth. Like, why do that? We, 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 we desperately need a spectrum of ideas in order to, to learn and to grow. And, and Susan Lloyd Parks does that. She does that in her writing unflinchingly so. Um, and so while I'm grateful for the things that we can identify as being cultural standards, I, I am also grateful for the opportunity to grow those standards and for that quilt to expand, to expand. Ah. Uh, from Jeff McMurrow, theater con, it needs to happen. <laughs> I'm so sure. <laughs> Everybody just come as Shakespeare or something. <laughs> it's a whole bunch of guys in tights. And, I mean, uh, you could all come as Shakespeare, but that limits you so much. It does, it does. I'm gay. Theater come, let's do it. Houston needs, needs a few more festivals, so why not? Yeah, we've got this, you know, wonderful, huge uh, convention center downtown. Surely we can... Listen, listen. I'm coming as Susan. I got some folks maybe that'll come as... um. Oh, what's my girl who wrote Stick Fly? We could just come as all kinds of things. But the, the, the tough part would be you'd have to like carry the book with you so that you could help people make reference. It's not like coming dressed as Wonder Woman or something. It's like, oh yeah, I know who that is. But hey, it'd be a good educational outlet. Okay. Uh, so, so Debrina follows up her question with, I was more thinking of how non-Blacks might perceive her inc uh, perceive Susan Laurie Parker's inclusion of those aspirations. To me, she operates as a human and creative first, which is important and freeing to those who are inspired by Parks, such as you and her and many others. Right. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I love that concept. I, I have no idea how non-Blacks feel about her work um but hey if you identify as non-black feel free to throw in a comment but i agree that um she is definitely uh willing to go where most negresses have not gone before can we say negresses i say it so i just said it. It. yeah they used it in star trek right and negresses <laughs> granted they had a Lincoln saying it but what episode is this <laughs> I, I don't know but it was uh one of the original series episodes, you know, one with Uhura, where she's... I'm, I'm going to defer to you on this one, Ian. I, I think you might be the... You might you might know a little bit more about this than I do. <laughs> Expert. There you go. You can I mean, it was Star Trek in the 60s, so who That's knows tough. what they were thinking. You know, crazy times. Yeah. Crazy show that gave us the first interracial kiss on network television because William Shatner refused to do any of the takes without it correctly. And for that, we are grateful. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, let's, let's go. Thank you for educating me today, Ian. That's awesome. That's awesome. I see why they picked you to moderate. All right. Well, I think that's enough for today we've gone for about 40 minutes uh thank you crystal for joining us and talking thank you everyone on facebook who is spending part of their monday evening with us uh we intend to be back on monday the 29th we don't have anyone lined up yet but we will let you know when we do thank you all and so long <laughs>